This is KAZU Pacific Grove, Monterey Bay Public Radio. My name is Mae Russell. The name of the program is World Watchers. And before I begin the program, I want to say that this hour, World Watchers, is made possible in part by Aries Arts in the heart of Capitola Village, serving Santa Cruz's growing consciousness for over 20 years. Uh, last week on World Watchers, I had scheduled a plan, sort of a marathon, a five-hour marathon with various writers, authors from around the country that I thought would excite you and interest you. Bill Turner, who wrote a fabulous book on the Robert Kennedy assassination, Judge Jim Garrison from New Orleans, Don Fried from L.A., and I had a list of people, John Judge, David Emery, Barbara Honiger, and so forth, but this week... I made the decision that I would not do the five-hour program, and as I announced last week, I wasn't sure if I would go off the air. I knew I would go off in Los Angeles. Uh, the program was played on KPFK. For those of you who didn't hear the program last week, that was because of a call I got saying that uh, my head would be blown off and there wouldn't be a trace of me. I would be missing like those people I talk about in Argentina and Chile. And, of course, I've been detailing and saying that I wanted to put into a computer the death squads in America. That's one of the last told stories, the real story of this country, and the plans in 1962 to kill at least 10,000 uh, political left, arranged by Mr. Hunt and Robert Brown of Soldier of Fortune, and their plans to wipe out all voices of opposition. Um, since this past week, two other people in Los Angeles uh, have gotten calls. They're active with the Christic Institute. And a gentleman who listened to KPFK down there knew what was happening called me. I've never met him. And he got the same message, you're going to stop immediately what you're doing. You're not going to do it anymore, and we're going to blow you up. We're coming down to blow you away. They're coming up here and going down there. And I realized uh, when he called me that this could keep mushrooming, and indeed another third person got a call. One said, I'm a fascist, and I'm a proud of it, and then another call implied that he came from the armies of Oliver North, defending Ollie North. And I did say that I believe the heat is coming from George Bush, the CIA director. I don't call him the vice president. I call him the CIA director. And the Christic Institute coming to trial. And, of course, Danny Sheehan is living with the threat of a bullet all of the time. He's under a terrible scrutiny he's already hit upon and exposed one contract to kill him. And it's inconceivable how he's going to go to court with these people. I can't believe it. Uh, we'll believe it when we see it or hear about it. And then also the special prosecutor is coming in with indictments. And uh, therefore, the means of communication between the networks of telephones, radio, and so forth can be cut off because these things were meant to happen. The secret team was meant to be running out of Switzerland with uh, Mr. Willard Zuger, the banker for Robert Vesco, who works the Medellin cartel, and so forth. These teams were not meant to give up their six or eight million that they have, and they were going to have 64 million in Frankfurt, Germany, where they could run countries, all, run operations all over the world, and they haven't budged at all. Mr. Secord and Hakeem, General Secord and Albert Hakeem, still have their six million profit in uh, Merrill Lynch Bank in London, and nobody seems to touch them. The special prosecutor will try, but lots of luck. Now, there were changes made in my mind, as I say, not to have the five-hour broadcast this evening. It's only going to be two hours, and it's going to be a fundraising for Kazoo, and that presents a terrible problem, the synchronicity of this timing in our fundraising, because a lot of you people enjoy Kazoo in general, but a lot of my subscribers particularly are listening and are glad to support this station and have been very, very generous about supporting the station with pledges from $35 up. Somebody just sent in $200 this past week. And um, they're very generous in wanting to help hear this news. They want to hear it, and they want to help the station that provides you with the uh, place where this kind of material originates, right from Kazoo here in Pacific Grove. Uh, I have a problem because I said that people, if they send in their pledges, in advance would um, then we would have five hours of straight programming with these other persons and of course as I say I'm not going to have that long program and continuously ask you to give money to Zoo for five hours when um, 
some of you have to think about it because I'm not going to be on the air. Now, those of you who pledged in advance, I believe there's 10 of you. I have the names that I got at the station. Uh, I will have you to the potluck. That sounds unfair not to have the others. And if you pledge tonight, we do have other benefits. You can support the station uh, in terms of appreciating what you've heard. You don't have to uh, uh, stop sending because May Brussel isn't on. You can send money saying thank you for having the program. And if things uh, solve themselves, I can't see how it is going to resolve itself uh, with the elections coming up and Killer Bush running for president and hardly anyone tripping his toe. But in the event anything does come up like that and these people are apprehended, um, I mentioned the police, local sheriffs are aware, the FBI is aware, there's members of Congress, in particularly the Los Angeles area, that are infuriated. And uh, the LA Weekly, I believe, is going to do a story. These people feel tied off from being able to get information on a listener-sponsored station. And I did a live broadcast Wednesday with them and it isn't that you send in the money and then you hear the things that you want to hear. It's that the means of communication is being cut off. And a lot of people understand the seriousness of this, the implications of being stranded from being told things that they need to know in order to survive. And that's what it's all about. So we have this problem here um, of what to do. I'm going to ask you to call in uh, 375-3082. Uh, there is one three seven five seven two seven five tonight, and make pledges like you did before. And I am going to give you news, some very important stories um, that I, I don't like to have a two-hour period without throwing some of this stuff at you. It's so important. So you have to make your own judgment. Yes, I'll call up, and uh, uh, I am going to keep in touch with people. Uh, you can write to me at P.O. Box 22511, Carmel 93922, and I'll tell you what my plans are and what I'm doing. I'm not going to put on the air. Again, having a potluck is, is dangerous at this time, at this point in history, because um, I always open the doors. In fact, I, I can put on the air now, but I never even locked my house. People thought it was an armed camp. I never even locked the doors until last week. It was always... Well, some nights I did, and the one night... Like I came to Kazoo last week, and when I came home, there was a message right by my telephone letting me know that people had come in. So it doesn't matter if you lock it. It just says, we have access, we can get in even when you're away. But the people would always say, oh, do you have this uh, security or this door locked and phone line secure and all that stuff. And I, my personal friends can get on the line and tell you I never even locked a door night or day. So it was always open and all that valuable information was always there. Somebody could walk in and take the whole original gemstone file. Uh, I was offered $30,000 for that for movie studio and turned it down because I didn't think they'd do the right job with it. But it just sits around like all the other stuff and uh, it never was locked. So this is a big change for me to I have to put a uh, bias tape on each door to remind me the door is secure. I want to run out and put something in the trash, and you want to go out and, and put papers in the car for recycling. And all of a sudden, I say, oh, God, the perimeter is all safe. I can't even move. I have to wait till the morning. <laughs> That's such a different lifestyle. Somebody came over yesterday and brought some fresh fish, and, and I cut off the head of wonderful fresh salmon. I'm and I'm going to run up in the trash. I, oh, I can't even get out. I don't want to bother with it. I'll put it in the freezer and I'll, I'll temp, empty it tomorrow. I don't even want to, you know. So I have to think in terms of security, and I'm increasing that. And uh, maybe I tested my luck too long. Uh, a gentleman who was at the house working on the security system said that five years ago, the CIA was talking about blowing me away, and he worked with the intelligence. He didn't know how I was around five years that they talked about this. And so... Uh, uh, I've, I've pushed my luck for 17 years on the air, and of course I'm a political being. I'm not going to stop everything. I couldn't do that, and uh, uh, I could do it if I wanted to, but I don't want to. So I'll be around doing my thing, and if you want to call me and send letters, you know, we'll share what's going on. And I do want you to call up and uh, contribute. Think about the station, what it's given you in the past four years, and if you new listeners, uh, just to send $35, that's the equivalent of a few movies and a few beers, and you've already learned more than you're going to learn in a, a lifetime listening to the regular news. So there are people out there to answer the phone, and then Tom Davis, 
um, Tom Davis Books up in Capitola, is going to give a premium, The American Swastika by Charles Hyam. And that is a very important book that Nazism and uh, corporations uh, right from 1930s until the present. And he obtained over 30,000 documents from the government, and uh, he's putting them in library at USC, so if people go to Los Angeles, you can get his material on Errol Flynn and the Gestapo and the Nazi period, and he's making them available. And Tom Davis is going to give everybody who pledges the book, The American Swastika. So right there, you're, if you pledge Kazoo, you're getting a book that's worth $20, and you're only spending 15 bucks, which is two programs, maybe, or whatever. So I want you to call in the station and... Uh, uh, even though you won't hear World Watchers for a while, it may be three weeks from now, I, they'll round these guys up and I'll be back on. I don't think they will, and I don't think it's that easy. And uh, I've been talking about fascism for 17 years, and as I've said to a lot of people this week, either I was wasting my time and I could talk about it till I was 80 or 90 years old, or it's really coming. And if it's coming, what do you expect? Except what you get is the threat, you know, to blow your brains out if you talk about it. That's what fascism is. That's what I've been talking about. So you had to take the World Watchers on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Now, we have a problem. Orange is here and JT and uh, th three or two. Which one? Okay, we'll turn on mic two and three. One. Uh, one? Okay, I don't know which ones you're on. They're, they've been helping, working hard at the station to raise funds, so maybe they'd like to say a few words. We'd first like to say how angered and how sad we are at the news that's been happening with May. And we, while we can never fill her shoes, we'll be doing our best to fill this, this two hours with some information that will still somehow grab us all together and educate us uh, so we're not so isolated from one another. And we hope that this gets resolved shortly so we can have May back on the air. There will always be a spot for you here, May. You've been a delightful and valuable person to too many of us out there to have this be terminated by some fellow out there who has a weird sense of values. Or a team. A team, yeah. Call, call it the uh, West Point. <laughs> the West Point, yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> he's been proud to have you uh, uh, be the, the station that you've been broadcasting out of, and I feel the way you do. I'm surprised it hasn't happened before now. I'm, <laughs> I'm pleased and surprised, yeah. uh, but, and hopefully nothing will happen, and, but I do think... I think it's wise of you. You always have to trust your own intuition, and you have to trust your own gut feeling. And if you feel that this is serious, then that's all you can do. Well, it's more than an intuition. You get a telephone call that says we're going to blast <laughs> you away. Oh, look at this. Three people have donated Bless already. your heart. Marvelous. Good Isn't that Thank you. It's more than an intuition. I did go off the air when I was at KLRB because uh, there was somebody hanging around the barnyard theater that was in that complex at the time. And he was managing the theater, and I knew his, the man's nephew, and he told me his uncle worked for the intelligence community, and uh, this uh, told me about the mysterious things he did, and the uncle was going to work at the Barnyard Theater along with his brother. And I felt, hey, I'm coming in at night, and not only did I feel something, but everyone around me, several people died, and people's apartments and homes were broken into, and the typewriters had Lee Harvey Oswald and Saran Saran, and something mm. was happening to all these people around me. And and with this character there, I wasn't going to go in at 10 at night and leave at 11 and et cetera. And I went off the air and continued the tapes by subscription. And in that interim, he wrote a book called Blow Away. I can tell you his name. It was Jeez. Shellmeyer. He was in the Broadway play, Tiny Alice. He's an actor. And he tells about blowing heads off and putting people on meat hooks. And he worked for CIA and was a hired assassin. In between, he was a Broadway actor and was working at the wanted to work at the barnyard. So this is... <laughs> yeah, too it's, it's too, too much. Yeah. It, it's not just an intuition. This was a threat. He never threatened me, but he wrote a very nice book about people he didn't even give a warning to. And, you know, things were happening all around. Uh, tonight, I, I, told, I canceled most of the people that are going to call, but um, Ted Gandolfo is a researcher in New York who's done tremendous work on the Kennedy assassination and just came out with a new book about the House Select Committee. So he's always wanted to be on the program, so I said I'd call him tonight a little after 8. But just about a month ago, two months ago, Ted was beside himself. He'd moved out from Manhattan to Long Island, and his wife was coming home, and she was raped by two people and was really unconscious in a hospital. He was just terrified, and they went, then broke into his house. She was in the driveway and took tapes from his house and, you know, just brutalized. And then I was thinking about Don Freed was going to be a guest. I talked to him tonight, and... 
It wasn't too many years ago when he was in Boston at a conspiracy conference and his very young wife, and they had just adopted a baby, had this massive stroke and dropped dead. She was in a coma when he came for two days and was dead. I've never chronicled for various listeners the hazards of being a researcher because then I'd get you afraid to even listen. Mm -hmm. But it's a mile long, and each one you speak to, uh, you realize, uh, I was talking to somebody this week about a story, and and then I thought, God, what am I doing? I'm not talking about his wife who was pregnant and her death. And, and I went down to L.A. to help Terry Moore write a book and was ghostwriting this book for she'd been married to Howard Hughes. And every time she'd tell me about a person that she liked, uh, they were dead. Nikki Hilton, and she liked him, and, and then he quickly died, and Jimmy Dean, and and Howard Hughes was older and wanted her, and Jimmy Dean was crazy about her, and all of a sudden this car crashed that turned out to be mysterious. And Montgomery Clift, I said, Terry, you know, we're talking about seven people you were close to, and they're all dead. We're writing obituaries. We're not writing a mm -hmm. story about you and Howard Hughes. And then when the book was finished, she needed someone to type, and a woman knew we were writing it, and she was a, a woman that worked for Reagan when he was governor in California. Her first name's Marge, and she lives in Sacramento or somewhere. She moved in with her husband, took his scissors, and tore the whole book up in shreds. And when I went down back to L.A. to see Jerry Moore, her husband sat in the living room with machine guns and rifles, and it was an armed camp. Mm -hmm. Some of those things I haven't even put on the air. So, uh, well, you know, it's yeah. it's it's interesting in that when something like this that awful happens and makes us feel disconnected, sometimes we wake up from some kind of stupor we've been in. You've always been there, man. It's easy to let you do the work and and take the risks and do everything and and half believe or fully believe or whatever. But when something like this happens, it makes you have you have to it wakes you up somewhere in your mind and you go, wait a minute, this stuff's happening. We can't just let May do it. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, we're going to have to find other ways to reach out to each other and make sure you're not just out there on your own as a target for well, someone. Well, ab absolutely. This is what Roy Tuckman said, the producer. He has a show that's been on nine years on KPFK. And he was just genuinely hurt. And I have never met him. I just loved the person immediately. And I said, come up anytime. He was so shaken. And he enjoyed having the program on. And then the station manager called me. And she said, "We the people have relied on us for so long. Mm -hmm. And now we can't put this on the radio. And she said, our listeners feel so helpless. And they are because she said, sometimes I think we give too much information that they can just sit and listen and feel that it's a weather vane, but they never do it themselves. That they, And yeah. what, you know, that's what I said last Wednesday on the air was, you're on your own now because everything that I have on the air is public domain. It's Wall Street Journal. It's New York Times. It's, it's the L.A. Times. It's the L.A. Herald. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to read off these names if they don't mind. Here's no, I think two more great. pledges. Isn't that wonderful? You want to mm -hmm. thank I'll them do now? the first name. And, and you know, <clears throat> the, okay, let's read this off, and then we'll go back. But the station manager there was saying, you know, we're so helpless. And I was saying, look, if you spend more time and don't worry about seeing The Last Emperor and don't see, worry about seeing all mm -hmm. these movies that come out and all the Academy Award things and all the schlock and all the the Emmys and the Bammies and everything, and you just spend time reading like I read, you'll see it too. You just got, I gave up a lot of theaters, a lot of television. I don't think I gave up anything. I gave. But people think they need this constant entertainment, people to drop in and talk blah, blahs, have a beer, and they just don't take even a paper and sit and see what it says for a given day. Mm -hmm. And now people are just going to have to do it themselves. You know, they're on their own to do more reading. I told them down there, Read two books a month. Go to these library sales, use books. You can pick them up, some of these paperbacks, for 10 or 15 cents and read about the cult of intelligence and secrecy and, and the Nazi connections and, and Galen's by the century. You, you can get books. You can go to the library, and they're free, and the libraries have these newspapers, and that's now you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like you were mentioning today. If people would actually read the newspaper, mm -hmm. if you actually read and digest what is in the newspaper every day, a big town newspaper, you can get a feel for what's going on. That's and right. that's something, uh, if you, the means of communication and education are broke down, then we're lost. Then we are lost. lost. In fact, I brought in just four articles from the morning paper to just give a sample. I'll give the names of the people because I think... It is really great. Christopher, I won't give your last names, but Christopher is called in and pledge, which is wonderful. And Good, Goodrich Wells, or Wells, I want to give the two names, okay, <laughs> from Santa Cruz, and Sue, and Lori, and Kelly, that's, that's wonderful that they're going to 
continue to support Kazoo because they're saying thank you. Thank you and all. The, and you mm-hmm. will get American Swastika. Charles Hyam is one of the great writers. His father is a member of the House of Lords in London, and uh, he's half Jewish. And he came to this country, and he wrote fluff things on movie stars, and he's very much in the social circle of L.A. He's very elite, you know, one of the the busybodies around there. And he was writing about movie stars and, and various people and uh, biographies and poetry and then somebody he was going to write about Errol Flynn and somebody said well why don't you tell the real story mm-hmm. and he said well what is the real story and he said that he worked in the Gestapo so Errol, I have left Errol Flynn? oh yes in fact he, he when he filmed movies with Ronald Reagan one in 1940 and 1942 he co-starred with Reagan and he was with the top Gestapo like Heinrich Himmler and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor he's down in Bahamas and I always said the early Reagan was the Warner Brother Earl Flynn days when he was tangled as an informer of the FBI and working with a man who was active in the Gestapo. Mm-hmm. His actions now didn't come out of nowhere. So Charles Hyam wrote that book, and then in between he'd write one on Olivia de Havilland, his fluff pieces, and then he wrote Trading with the Enemy, which was his second real political book, which is fantastic, and my listeners should get those, library or buy them and own them. And then the then he did one on Merle Oberon, how she was half black but had to say she was Indian or she couldn't mm-hmm. work in Hollywood. And then he wrote this American Swastika, which is a masterpiece. And he worked and worked on this, and we've been friends for years. He's been up to the house in Carmel. And, and uh, uh, he, when American Swastika came out, I happened to be in New York a couple of years ago, and I went to Barnes & Noble, and here you have this bookstore. And in the window is a book by Richard Nixon that they're pushing as a bestseller. And you go through all these trash books, these bestsellers that no one will ever think or care about, novels, fiction, nonfiction, on how to find security on a wet day or something, you know? <laughs> and, and then I went to the section where the nonfiction Nazi kind of thing would be, and then very quietly up in a shelf is American Swastika. And people, it could save everybody's life who's walking through the store at the time, and nobody knows what it is. The, the book publisher buys it doesn't advertise it then it goes on it moves on and then eventually they disappear and they're collector's items and i look at manhattan with a population of nine million and all the store windows are richard nixon's latest bestseller why do you suppose a publisher buys that in the first first place if they're not going to do anything with it because they own the rights and then they can send them on remainders mm-hmm. and you never see them again they dump uh, them they crush them and destroy so it's a way them of now control, yeah it's a way of control. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the guests I was going to have on, I, I could maybe you'll call in on the talk show part. Uh, Tom, you listen to the program. Tom Davis, uh, we were going to do a longer segment. He can call in about the importance of getting these books when they come out because now they can just destroy them, put them in a vat, and put die and get rid of them. So by buying it, you own it. Then the person doesn't own. Mm-hmm. And I always said, if I publish, I'll self-publish because that's the only way to get it out. So, oh my gosh, here's another, oh, isn't this great? Here's Jeff, who's subscribed from Santa Cruz and wants to help. These people are going to get American Swastika, and that's great. I, I was really worried because I thought, well, my people are pretty neat. Yes, they are. They are. I mean, and we, we need each them. other. And, already. and I think everybody yeah. can feel that the support yeah. that's going out to you at a time that is very difficult. They're and, paying for this class that you've station. given them. They're really, they, yeah, they always came through. They're really neat because... Not being on anymore, they say, well, why should I give it to the station? And they're not doing that. And they will get American Swastika, so it's the equivalent of like $15 pledge and a $20 book. Mm -hmm. And they'll have the book, and they'll feel good that the $15 paid towards Kazoo. But, you know, the, the, like you say, Orange, the newspapers, just today's Monterey Herald, an article, Apparent Racial Threats, Hound Black Woman. This is a woman who lives in Monterey, was in the army seven years eight years she lives with her son she works at the dli got an apartment in monterey and then gets notices that she has to get out of the apartment that they break the glass in her car and they call themselves the cling-up crew that uh, she's on i suppose in south carolina it was different than here but the cling-up crew is to make sure that no blacks ever live in monterey even when you're working at the presidio so they throw eggs at the doormat and they scared her out and uh, uh, she has no recourse. They say the Talon's going to stay clean or get out. So that's the cleanup crew that was today. Another one, armed man kills one and injures four others. 
in crowded church. This is Emporia, Kansas, where a man from California, the same person, I think, that's giving the threats here, the same organization group, uh, in California license plate, he goes, drives into Kansas, starts shooting, and he tells them, I'm from the white supremacists, and he starts shooting the church members. They grapple with the police came. One was dead, and others are injured. To be injured, not killed, doesn't mean you're not in a wheelchair the rest of your exactly. life, yeah. or your eardrums are pierced. You, you know, they don't tell them. you mm -mm. that seven people could be mutilated for life. If there's only one dead, it's okay. But I found out, you know, that, that uh, in fact, I had on a program, the San Francisco Police Department, when eight people are killed, they report it as one death. It's one incident. They've been doing this for 15 years, rapes and murders, mm -hmm. that they call it one, one report, one death. And they've been covering up the death squads in San Francisco. So he says, white supremacists. The call in L.A. says, I'm a fascist and I'm proud of it. And the other one, I'm the troops of Ali North, which is West Point and Pentagon. Another one today, debt burden Philippines counting on buried treasure. Now, I've done programs on John Singlau being the most important key pin of the whole milieu of World Anti-Communist League, Nazism, fascism. And he has his first hold on the Philippines' money. The emperor is still alive, and they buried away for this propitious moment to dig up the money. A hundred million to two trillion is to go to world fascism. Jeez. You could arm all of these people. That is just, okay, that's today's paper also. And then, uh, I'll just do today's and one other important story. Jailed child molester may have spread AIDS to boys. San Francisco Chronicle, and you read about, he belongs to that NAMBLA, North American Man-Boy Love Association. Could have given AIDS to 139 youth, but then as you read it, you see that he belongs to the Bay Area Satanist cult that they, that's called the Ordo Templi Orentis, which I've talked about, the OTO. And when they raided the apartments of these men, they have ceremonial altars where they have these little boys and these people are being sacrificed also and sexually abused. And then they said NAMBLA has literature and documents from a ver variety of occult groups. And of course, I've talked about the Church of Set. And Michael Aquino and Anton LaVey and the church and the Satanic, but Aquino's the Defense Department, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and NATO, and it says they're part of occult groups. And it said this group have been organized in Boston for ten years, Sacramento, San Bernardino, and that's where the heat is from Riverside, San Bernardino, and the Military Academy at West Point. That's just today. And so World Watchers listeners know that I've been talking about those mm -hmm. things. So those items are and then Wall Street Journal this week on the front page. It re involves a man who came here from Tunisia, Tunis, a few years ago with $43 million. And then he got into some hanky-panky in the bankruptcy. Uh, people wanted to find out what he was doing with the money. And on the front page of Wall Street Journal, right after my program last week, uh, I, I'm on Monday, and then Tuesday I read that Mr. Goetz, G-U-E-Z, -Z, that's his name, went to the accountant who's taking care of the fair, uh, of the bookkeeping, Mr. Bergenfield, and Goose said that he had weapons and demolition experts who could blow up a house without a sign of how it's done, and he said to the trustees of the bank, I have your addresses. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, even with house security, I can demolish the whole house and you'll never know where it is. And this man is telling the accountants in Manhattan, a fancy accountant firm on 7th Avenue, you know, that I'm gonna destroy your entire house and you people won't even know what happened from. So these threads aren't just on the telephone. This is the Wall Street <laughs> Journal just this week. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of thing I brought in just to show that I'm not the only one. What's so scary is that I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. And the unlimited money that Sing Lao, the Emperor of Japan, is still alive, and they've been working so that he would have $2 trillion to control the world. That's the Nazi, Japanese, fascist money and they know where it's buried. They're pretending that everyone's digging a hole. And I've documented for years that when they're ready to surface it, they will. That's pretty far along, because who can equal two trillion? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and with West Point being mentioned in these articles, and, and I've talked about Michael Aquino and, and Ollie North Delta Force. He, he's in the same Delta Force, was the head of it, that a queen of the Church of Set was involved, taking children from the Presidio to his house and doing rituals, the same kind of rituals they're talking about here, and all charges were dropped. Really? All charges were dropped? Oh, he was, yes, against the man, Mr. Humphrey, who had the nursery school kids, 60 children with venereal diseases, and the pediatrician at the Presidio telling, you know, sexually assaulted. All dropped. All parents had to drop it. 
Well, what do you think, people like out who are listening right now, and Orange and myself, with you gone in particular, you <sighs> off the air for a while, you read these things, you, you, you go out and you read the two books that you're talking about, the newspaper articles, what do you do from there? Because well, while that's a lot, that's not enough to but stop But that's it. sort of a, I get that question a hundred times a day if I'm on the phone. Incidentally, there's, oh, no. oh my God, look at these pledges. That's great. Can you believe this? A letter from Pam. Pam sent in. Jim sent the station. Dave sent the station. I won't give the last names. April and John and Judy. Can you believe this? Thank you so much. That's Thanks. real support, Can May. you really believe it? <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. That's support for you guys. It's wonderful. Well, it's Isn't support for you as well and all the fine It's support work you've for the doing. system. The, the system, system of public radio where things can happen and nobody says where, whether you're going to be on the air or not and the information is available. Now, it's support for that. There are two factors, too. Like If somebody comes to me and says, what can I do? I have to know who they are and what, whether they mean the question or if it's just redundant. There are tapes of everything I've done from, uh, I've been on the air 17 years, but I've been making the tapes available here in Pacific Grove for the past 11 years. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody in Monterey now who also duplicates the tapes. There's two sources, and one has the master tape of everything from 1977, March 77, up, it, up through the present. And down in L.A., they're ordering all the back tapes and having they want to order them all, David Emery's tapes up north and my tapes. What they can do, everything that a person needs to know, I've had on the air week after week. And if people really wanted it, it, it the tapes are $5. I don't make a cent, never did, if they send in 5 bucks, And they sat down systematically. If four people sat down and put five each in one night a week, invested an hour in listening one night a week and got together one you know one night a week for a month and listened to them then said is this true or isn't this true and my god this is true the only way you can handle it is if you understand it and if you don't want to invest that time or that money no oh i can't believe this my god this must be some kind of a record isn't that's it? great <laughs> have you had anything like this <laughs> nope no, nope. three more. Can, have you really? Nope. No, this I've is been a, listening. Has anyone done this? This is no. a first. Leslie, Claire, Margaret. Can you? I'll let, read them all off at the end of the hour. I mean, I've only been on thirty-five minutes. That's great. Can you believe that? That shows you the sport for your for you out there and for the kind and of work you that you're guys. doing. Can you? Be, I really thought I didn't know, but I felt terrible because I thought that maybe people would say, well. If I can't hear it anymore, well, then, you know, the What's station's going to have it. Yeah. But you all are going to get American Swastika, and you'll be very grateful to have it. And a lot of the people got in banks we trust, the pen mm -hmm. of the new book. And, but the thing is, you can't, you have to decide, what am I going to give up this week? And I'm going to listen to it and, and see, like, with this kind of news, it's flowing out. And I have another prize story of the week. I have a few more. Uh you know, this is what she said, and this is it, and we are victims, too. Are we going to be the last to know? Uh, things like this, if people followed it every week, or if they didn't follow and they studied, they could alert Congressman Panetta. They mm -hmm. could alert the officials, you know, the federal communications. You know, the FBI can come in on it if we have more leads, because being a licensed broadcaster and being on the air 17 years, it's a federal crime. This person... Mm -hmm. It's no comfort to Alan Berg to have his head blown off. It is a federal crime. But the people that did it did go to jail for the rest of their life and are never going to get out because you can't shoot a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things you can't do. It's different than the people in L.A. that work for the Chris Dick Institute. Or I think Danny Sheehan taking away his, his civil rights would mm -hmm. be a federal crime also. Yeah. But this is a federal crime if we get more leads and the FBI has to go into it. Mm -hmm. And the more people that get into it, the easier it is to get leads. But people have to invest. There isn't anything new. There's new things happening. But there isn't. Any, if people invested in tapes and sat down and talked about it um, for what's going on in the past, then reading the papers in the present would make sense. Mm -hmm. But they have to be willing to do that. And action would just flow from having that knowledge. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you can't make a cure without a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just ridiculous, and I keep saying, you know, you, a dentist, if he sees a cavity, he could make you happy and just fill it up, but then you lose your tooth. It's not going to help you any, it, you know, maybe more painful to have the cavity fixed or the crown, but the other way, you lose everything, mm -hmm. and uh, people have never, my listeners have realized that 
uh, it's important and it's later than you think. But they've invested that hour a week and they tape it off the air and they get the subscriptions and they want to know. And it's been available for those who want to know. It, Education is powerful. Well, that's why they say the more you know, anymore. the less easier you're duped. Yes. We're going into a presidential can campaign. We yes. have all kinds of wool being pulled over our eyes in uh, daily, yes. daily by these people. Absolutely. The more we talk to each other, the more we know. Um, you have to know. The more, uh, the the less fools will be. Yeah. And you have to know when candidates come through. Um, oh my goodness. Oh my. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Please say phone number, 375-3082. Well, somebody called you, so they have the number. Man, 375. They called information. Oh, 375. 7275. 7275. And 375-3082. But I have very smart listeners. They called information. Yeah. <laughs> See well, how well-educated they we'll are? We'll make it easy for them. <laughs> sure. See, I, if I didn't give the number, it's funny. They said, please say the number, and they, they called you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But well, for the other people who are not... Uh, well, okay. And Joni called in, or is that Tony? It looks like Joni uh, from Aptos. And uh, incidentally, all of you that are listening, that's a lot of people to call my house, so maybe some of you space it and don't keep the lines busy. But I have plans for what I'm going to do, and you won't be cut off. Uh, I'm just not going to announce them on the air. And uh, Well, could so, you give your, your uh, mailing address again for people? Yeah, P.O. Box, write this down, P.O. Box 22511. Carmel 93922. And you can still communicate with the station. Yeah, and you can send communicate a, through KAZU. Yeah, through KAZU. And send a self addressed stamped envelope. Oh, is that my water I left there? Oh, sorry. No. Send a self addressed stamped envelope. Yeah, grabbed a piece of cheese from the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> send a self addressed stamped envelope. And because the people in LA from Pacifica did, it, it's ironic that Wednesday night that it went off that this man called, the program was on from 12 to 1. And uh, during the day, I spent 12 hours just answering mail from that station. One oh, letter after the other. People wanting back tapes, wanting to know what to do. And I sent Roy Tuckman down there about 35 or 40 letters just to see. There were some bikers that are in jail, maybe getting the death penalty. People from Tehachapi Prison, an Iranian, one from Jordan, Two people from Beverly Hills, or two, uh, one an agent for TV documentaries, one wanted to do a documentary on Martin Luther King, and people from all over. I mean, it's from San Diego out to the Palm Desert or whatever. They have a big range. And the, the people that didn't write, you don't know what they think, but these people were really, you know, thank you. Now I see these connections. And I did feel, I might have mentioned on World Watchers before, that there was a series of events that I felt things were going to come down because. About two weeks before, I wasn't getting my papers one day, and I didn't get the mail the next day. And I called the postmaster, which I do about every three years. It happens maybe like election time, like mm -hmm. you say, Orange. And I, you know, have never had any friction or anything with the postal people. But I said, um, I have to talk to you. I want my mail. You know, mm -hmm. I want my newspapers. And he said, oh, man, oh my God, this is the world's record. It is, I <laughs> World think you're right. world's oh record. Oh, my God. It's her flows. I said, you know, I, I, he said, he told me how there's 15 guys that separated and it's cling. At the end of the day, everything's on the road. I said, no. I mentioned the relief guy that was on that week. And I said, now, tomorrow, he doesn't come in for a week. You call him and you don't say, have you seen anything of May's? You just say, May wants it. Mm-hmm. And the next day, there were three bags of mail, newspapers and mail. But there is a part of the post office called Seals where they open up to see. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the amount of uh, information or interest flooding in from the L.A. area, partly it did it, too. Because once they caught on, it's a huge population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, And, and then mm -hmm. if they saw that, they say, you're not on the air anymore. And I'd spent the day just stuffing yeah, envelopes. Mm -hmm on how to get back tapes, and I have lists of back tapes, and uh, there's 45 pages. I charge $10, just legal size 45 pages of back tapes. And, uh, you know, this is the way that Khomeini came into power. I've talked about on the air. And people who studied the Iranian Revolution, he left Iran and went to Paris, and he made tape cassettes. Oh. That's how I happened to go to tape cassettes in 1972. A friend of mine traveled around Europe. And all the might of the Savak and all the might of the United States Army and everybody couldn't stop him because he made cassettes that went into the mosque to the middle class. It's not, mm -hmm. oh, 
Can you believe this? Can you believe this? The phones people, haven't you know, stopped ringing. I haven't stopped talking. They have Harriet, Josh, John, Robert, Al, Paul. I'll have to write each one of these or give each one a hug and kiss. Maybe I'll have to have some potlucks. I can't believe this. It's you terrific. all do this deserve wonderful. it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it is you absolutely terrific. Come to a potluck. They, the gals there at the station have never been to one. They're really nice. These people yeah. are great. We've gone to a couple, not, know, not from the marathon, but uh, right, other woman, things that you've Carol had. Left. Yeah. What a cook. This you know, I just is. recently found out KPFA was the first public supported station and the person who started it everyone told him he was crazy that you could have a public supported radio station a non-commercial public supported radio station and yeah it was like 1949 or i something have a book since. on pacifica don't glorify it it was the time when the intelligent community was starting and they wanted to have a viable left as we put in fascism to show we have two voices here mm-hmm. like the democratic party mm-hmm. and the republican and i was on uh, Bob Vass is KP- WBAI in New York for five years, and they were just wonderful wildfires after the Watergate story. And Bob Fass was the programmer in the country. People in New York all listened to WBAI. And and then along came Clay, Clay Felker of the CIA, who wrote for Village Voice, and uh, Mr. Coburn, who moved into this country from England in 1972 when Watergate came down. Alex Coburn, the great liberal, ha, 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 who says... He just set up at Berkeley two weeks ago that the biggest disservice people could do to the, the left movement was to investigate assassinations. <laughs> and that's how Hitler came to power. Alex Coburn came from London and became the viable left. So but they wrote a thing, Up the Maypole in the Village Voice, Hard Way to Raise Money, having May and Bob Fast, and that station then literally went broke and has been scrounging and scraping ever since. The station just, they lost their property on 62nd Street they had and went to 34th, and it went into salsa and all kinds of uh, items that didn't really shake the system that went into, you know, different programs that pleased everybody, Mm -hmm. but didn't rock any boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad you brought up Pacifica because then people are so incensed that they had a fundraising there. We raised thousands of thousands Mm -hmm. thousands in Manhattan, and nothing, they stopped sending it. So people began to research on who started Pacific, and it was the Vera Foundation and the Kaplan Fund and the intelligence community. As a matter of fact, it, it shocked a few people, maybe, and maybe you don't know this, but uh, when I was doing this thing last week on KPFK, I said, look, you know, it's terrible that one person from an organized group, obviously, because they have these bunkers, they're going to take you where you'll never be seen. I said, it's bad enough for a right-winger who, like, shoots in the church and says, I'm the white supremacist. But don't think that fascism, I'll say this slowly for my listeners, and they know it, I've said it, don't think fascism comes from the right. It's a seesaw, and fascism comes from the left. And I said that up, and I didn't put it on the program while I was here, but I had it there, and I can say it now, that KPFA has Larry Bensky and Saul Nicker and Muldauer. I had on Muldauer. I had on the air down there, they're pathological liars and they're fascists hiding as the left. And that's why you can't get World Watchers or May Brussels. They call me when they have a fundraising, Barry Scott, and she does, oh, thanks. Three more, oh, my God, we have to add this up. Are you adding it up out there? Are they adding this up? I think the adding machine's they broken to. after this. Uh, and I said, you have fascists, people like uh, Larry Bensky, who carried the Iran-Contra hearing in Washington every day. If you give them back to me, I'll add them up. Add them up. I, well, let me just say, Yvonne and Mike and Mike, what do you think about this response? Great. Have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever really? It's too bad. It's too bad. That Have you ever? Yeah, but I, I mean, they can say, well, I'm not going to hear, I'm not going to give. Can you believe in less than an hour what these people are sending? And your your audience is a lot smarter than I think. Huh? Your audience is a lot smarter and more very well in tune than that. They are really, yeah, they are really tuned in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the other station, when I, while I was on Kazoo, and I'm going off the air now, and I don't like to talk about those people while I'm here, but now I'm back to independent. But when you bring up that they were the first, uh, what I would call Washington, hearings would go on, and Michael Ledeen's name would be mentioned. And I called up, and Bensky, no May Brussel. Any ignoramus can call and say something, no boats rock. But if you say... Well, as long as Ladine's names came up, talk about the Seizmi, the Italian intelligence that he's part of with Francesco Pazienza and Alexander Haig and our government. Haig, you know, part of this um, 
very, very fascist Nazi element with Fritz Kramer. That was his mentor. Hitler's famous general is Haig's mentor, who, who made him jump over 243 people to become a general at West Point. Well, you can't say that on Pacifica. You can't. They monitor. They have agents in residence, and you can't say that. That's what made this station so special, and KFJC with David Emery and KKUP, because they allowed, because what I was saying was always the truth. But th anything that reaches the whole Bay Area, and they have a station, it, it, it took Roy Tuckman in Los Angeles, who's been on the air nine years, who had the courage and saw things coming down and began to play David Emery's tapes, One Step Beyond and Radio Free America, and those are available too if people want to write and don't know about those. It took one man with courage in a population of several million to let people hear it. So it, it isn't that the, oh my goodness, what is this? Uh, let's see. I don't know. Your messages are upside down. Again, the number is 375-7275. Okay, I'll take some calls the second hour, and I am going to call Ted Gandalfa. What is Jesse Jackson's role during the Martin Luther King assassination? Big question. <laughs> that yeah. was on, who had him, uh, Larry King, or one mm -hmm. of the big people was asking him last week. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover wanted to get rid of Martin Luther King, uh, and he was organizing people for higher wages, which is a no-no, an integration. And Jesse Jackson was there at the Lorraine Motel, and he was downstairs, and it was common knowledge that Hoover had a designated black leader and that King should be killed. He told King to kill himself, or otherwise they'd have to kill him. And uh, they had a designated leader. And what Jesse Jackson did, he sort of pulled, but it didn't come off right. When Jackie Kennedy... Uh, left Dallas, they wanted her to change her clothes when she arrived in Washington, and she said, no, I want them to see what they have done, and she was filled with blood, but the president's head was on her body, and it was mm -hmm. blown off. She was jumping the back of the car to get pieces of the skull to put them together, you know, so that was a genuine presence. Jesse Jackson was downstairs, flew up to the balcony, and told people he cradled Martin Luther King when he was dead or dying, which he hadn't done, and he got some blood, and nobody knows how, and it was smeared over him in some way that he showed up in Chicago and started having press conferences about how it happened, which oh, isn't God. how it happened, and nobody knows how he got the blood on himself. It was a. I have a lot of articles, and I've done some on it, and so this week, I forget which program it was, I taped it off the air, and they asked him about the story, and he said, well, ask Reverend... Kyle's, I think his name was, and I have to look it up. He was on the way to another place. Uh, Reverend Martin Luther King was supposed to stay at the Holiday Inn. And then certain people, black community and leaders said, you can't stay there because you should stay in the poor black where the poor blacks stay and mm -hmm. don't stay at the hotel. So they switched the reservations. But the man that Jesse Jackson said this week to call wasn't even at the balcony. He says, well, you ask him. And it may be the man who changed the reservations. But they said, well, what do you know? He says, well, don't go back 20 years. Ask Reverend Kyle. He was on the way somewhere. Well, the one who was on the way wasn't smeared with blood. Mm -hmm. he, you know, and the one who was on the way didn't go to Chicago and hold the press conference. So he became the designated hitter, the spokesman for the blacks. And then when the House Select Committee on Assassinations had a $6 million investigation um, and said there was a conspiracy, he never has wanted to know who. So, you know, Jesse Jackson has been uh, the safe black candidate, and mm -hmm. they build up his ego. And You know, if a woman can't live in Monterey in our community and has worked six or seven years with the military, you're not going to get a black president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they'll build him up and build him up. And as then what do you get? They... George Bush. Mm -hmm. You got a message here? We right? have uh, 26 pledges, May. We have $900 you've raised so far for KAZU. 26 people have called right. in. I, and also, Their we thanks. had 10 earlier ones. And One exactly. day, we wondered how much was right. that. We have to look that up. They called, uh, you gave me the names of those people. The one I'll was get that. I'll get, get that. that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's uh, in 50 minutes. Yeah. When they're not going to get can you believe that? I think sometimes when something's about to leave, you appreciate it even more. Yeah, but even just appreciate it, they may say, well, I miss it and I appreciate it. But to continuously support the station really says a lot. Yes, it does. It really does. Because even though public radio and, yeah, with the history that you're giving, it's still the best we've got. 
Absolutely. As far as reaching one another and having access like these programs. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. And uh, uh, I can even slip in some notices and news stories. Uh-huh. <laughs> they won't know where they're coming from. Yeah. And send you a newspaper and say, hey, cite this. You know, um, one of the things I was thinking of doing, um, I'm working with Barbara Honiger and we're separating my files. And I always thought there should be a resurrection. Do you remember the Zodiac News Service? Did mm-hmm. you ever see those? Well, those were, went out to uh, FM stations all over the country, and you paid so much a month, and you got a package of news each week. And there are many stories that should alert people to appointments, to people who are going to be judges, who trials beginning and so forth that they don't know. And I was thinking of starting a news service where you send it out to the stations and they read on their stations. That's an idea, yeah. Yeah. We still get the information out, but somehow it protects the people doing it. Yeah. The only thing that's missing out of all of that is making the connections. Yeah. That That's the thing. And that you have an art at. Yeah. It's the making the connections of the past to the present that really is what makes me dangerous, mm-hmm. is that you're not supposed to. Uh, speaking of connections, this is an article that was in San Francisco Examiner, so it's not very exclusive. It's printed by Randolph Hearst the third. okay? Former CIA agent is running covert campaign for George Bush. Oh, another call from Jeff. Can you? Oh, my gosh. Thanks, Bless, Jeff. A 12 by 12. Can That's you? great, Jeff. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that amazing? That's just, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll do this, and then we'll go back to those other pledges and take a break at the top of the hour. A uh, former CIA officer who is highly critical of the Reagan administration, the way they run covert operations, is promoting the presidential candidacy of George Bush, former CIA director. The CIA operative is Miles Copeland, a covert operation practitioner who served in the CIA in the 1950s. That's when the CIA was formed in 47. He was a link to Gamal Abdel Nasser, the anti-Israeli Egyptian nationalist leader. Now, if I had a news service and if I were on World Watchers, I'd say that in 1950s, when the CIA helped Nasser, they brought in Otto Skorzeny, another co-partner of Fritz Kramer, running the Pentagon with Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig. And he brought out and resurrected all the Nazis who had escaped from Europe, many of them, that went to South America, to Argentina and Bolivia and Brazil, and set up these so Nazi armies that gen- then joined the CIA with the offices in Madrid and they were setting up the Nazification of the Middle East because as soon as Israel became a country in 1948, they surrounded it with Nazi armies that could come in later and wipe it out. That's why Egypt is now building American tanks that are going to be aimed at Israel hmm. with American defense money. So I would have a news service saying, read uh, Reinhard Galen's Spy of the Century and see who was the army in the 50s when Nasser came in. And you really have... The Waffen SS, the Gestapo, Otto Skorzeny was the epitome of the Waffen SS. And his Miles Copeland is now going to run the intelligence community. The article says Copeland won a degree of fame in the 60s as an author of the Game of the Nations. True. He says he and other retired CIA officers support Bush and when he was CIA director. And now, last summer, Copeland sent other retired intelligence operators a paper calling for a radical change. Well, after Watergate and after the MK Ultra program and the COINTEL program and the police spying and the FBI spying, uh, Jimmy Carter came in and Stansfield Turner tried to clean out the CIA. And there's a group of ex agents that were behind the whole General Secord uh, Iran Contra affair. And now they'll be back in when Bush is in. The ones that were fired were running those operations over there and arming the Contras and so forth. So he's working with these former. Uh, see, he says, the fault of the Reagan administration has not been in keeping secrets but doing in stupid things. And Copeland was, with Bush would work harder with the Arab nations in approaching Israel. And he's been trained for that since the 50s. Copeland acknowledged that such a view could cause problems for the Bush campaign because once you own the voting machine, you don't need the Jewish vote. Mm-hmm. Israel always got help if you had the Jewish vote. It would cause problems for the Bush campaign, but... He said the group believed U.S. support for Israel's integrity should continue. Bush was always wary of Israel's role in the secret weapons deal. Here, Barbara Honiger's done extensive work on Bush sat in Paris and made arrangements for arms to go to Iran, but Israel would do the work for them in return for Reagan winning the election so Bush could be vice president. They used Israel 
like they use the blacks and women and Jews and countries. And now he doesn't trust Israel without Israel getting arms to Iran mm-hmm. to keep Khomeini happy. Bush wouldn't even be pres- vice president. So now he says, you know, well, Israel is in the way. Well, take, we're just about almost up at the top of the hour. Should we take a break? Well, she wants to do a quick okay. update. We have 36 pledges so far, and when I was out there, the phones were ringing, and people were taking more than one pledge at once. Uh, we have $1,445 all one told hour. so far, not counting the two you have in your hand. And the, how about the other 10? That includes all those. Okay, and then there's Marilyn and there's Brandon. So this is another 70 right there, just in this one hour. Yeah. We're over $1,500 then for an hour. Is that pretty good? That's <laughs> wonderful. Oh, God. How are the other programs doing? Are you doing that per hour? Music doesn't do quite that much, no. <laughs> May, this well, is a special time. We all know that. Maybe people should listen to music, but they should read at the same time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she, May will be taking calls again at 8 o'clock for those of you who want to talk to her. Yes, I will. And I just want to say that the views expressed here are those of myself and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kazoo's staff or board of directors, and I want to say that the previous hour of World Watchers has been made possible in part by Aries Arts, and I want to thank them for this patron grant that they have had. And they're in the heart of Capitola Village, serving Santa Cruz's growing consciousness for over 20 years, and it is Aries Arts that's helping to contribute with Tom, mm-hmm. the uh, American swastika, and in appreciation for them having the patron grant, you can also get from Tom a list of books to study the things that I've had on the air so that you know what to do. He has uh, books from A to Z uh, detailing what's been coming down and how it's coming down, and I advise that uh, people you know, take advantage of that. So we'll take a break for about one minute, okay? And then we'll uh, come back on. I'll take calls, and then I'm going to have Ted Gandalfo. But don't call in and ask him. He'll be on with me. Don't talk about his wife and what happened. He's just getting over the trauma of that. The second half of World Watchers, which is a talk show program. And as I say, Ted Gandolfo is uh, going to be in touch with us. And you'll share some experiences with him. As he just came out with a book. Before it begins, I, I got so many cards here. I can't remember what I'm doing. This is KZU Pacific Grove, Monterey Bay Public Radio. The following hour is uh, World Watchers is made possible in part by ARC, Laser Optical Technology, a leading manufacturer of microcomputer peripherals located in Scotts Valley. For more information, call 438-7400. And maybe before we take all the calls, I should say that the views expressed here are those of myself. I won't put on later and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kazoo staff or board of directors. And before we take the call, I want to say that one gentleman came to the station and brought a check, and there's a pledge from Peter and Steve and Bob and Les and Crowell and Debrie and Al and Emil. I just can't believe it. I, I'll Wonderful. be in touch with all of you and be sending you some news sheets to keep you up because you were so nice. I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Well, maybe this is the call from Ted. Yeah. Okay, just a minute. Okay, Ted? Hello. Oh, hi. Ted? Hello, Dave. Okay, I've been giving an introduction. I explained to my listeners how you have a new book out on the House Select Committee. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, Could you speak a little louder? Okay, I'll speak a little louder. And uh, for my listeners, some of you know uh, Ted Gandolfo. If you don't, he's been a researcher who has compiled tapes, done television shows in New York, had his own program and has been very very active for years so uh are the boards okay or yeah they should okay now would you like to share some ideas with us on what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it how about those three what are you doing right now well uh uh first uh, at the outset i'd uh, like to thank you Bay, for giving me the opportunity of uh, informing your listeners of how and why the house select committee on assassinations did what they did in completely suppressing the evidence they obtained of direct CIA involvement in the murder of President John F. Kennedy from the citizens of this country. What I'm doing now, I've written uh, recently, completed writing a book, the only book of its kind, exposing the House Committee on Assassinations. The book is called The House Select Committee on Assassinations Cover-Up. Were you happy to see that listed in the catalog? Yes, it's actually listed uh, in uh, three catalogs and four newsletters. That may, but the cataloging of books on the Kennedy assassination makes it official now. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it has been advertised. I know, but it's nice to be among the collected items. Yes, Dave. Uh, you I, beat me. I'd like to uh, proceed. Well, I'm going to ask you some questions. You can proceed, but we're, it's not the format isn't just a cut and dry. You know, tell, you might just explain what the House Select Committee did and then tell what they didn't do in a bit. All right. Do you want to ask me some questions? Well, it was, they spent $6 million and even gave money back, didn't they? Because they didn't want to go any further. Uh, yes. It was a uh, most... Uh, but it wasn't just the fact that it was uh, an incomplete uh, investigation. Uh, what the committee... the When the first chief counsel, Richard A. Sprague, held his first press conference, he stated, and I quote him, quote, every single witness who had information relevant to our investigation would be called to testify, and every single document from the CIA and FBI will be subpoenaed, unquote. Yes. And at that point, the I have proof and documents uh, that I think some of them I've shared with you, and then the CIA propaganda assets, their own words, in the media, launched a series of attacks on Mrs. Sprague, which forced him to resign as chief counsel. Uh-huh. At that point came the masterstroke by the intelligence community. Uh, a former employee of the Justice Department named Robert Blake, he sh- was, shall we say, selectively selected. Who was the attorney for Mo Dallas, the mafia boss? Uh, yes, uh, an, organized, uh, an organized crime figure, Mo Dallas. Uh, Blakey defended, uh, presented... Uh, at Arthur David, in defense of Mo Dallas, yeah. when uh, when it appeared, uh, an article appeared about Mo Dallas, naming as a uh, member of organized crime in Penthouse magazine. That's right. So we, here we had the phenomenon, the duplicity, uh, the sort of schizophrenic uh, performance by Blakey, whereas first he worked for the Justice Department. In, uh, in, in investigating organized crime, becomes an organized crime expert, and then turns around and not only represents Mo Dallas, the organized crime figure, as I just mentioned, but then concludes, not only erroneously, but untruthfully, that organized crime killed Treader Jody Kennedy when he was the chief counsel of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Yeah, he wrote a book. Absolutely. No basis of, in fact, for that statement because of the fact that Jim Garrison, former New Orleans district attorney and now judge in New Orleans, uh, at that time had told me that he had given to a man named Clifford Center, an investigator, one of the top uh, investigators for the uh, committee, and a team of five, absolute proof which convinced them all that the CIA killed President Kennedy. That information was given to Fenton, who gave it to Blakey, who, uh, who completely suppressed it. And in a conversation that I had last year with Robert Blakey, he admitted, he slipped and admitted for the very first time that there even was a Fenton team, but he lied to me, and I have the tape, he lied to me when he said that, that most of Garrison's evidence was contained in the final report, when none of it is, and the name of Clifford Fenton or the evidence he accrued from Garrison is either mentioned in the final report or the 12 bodies of evidence uh, relating to the assassination of President Kennedy. I know. You know, uh, at the time of the Iran-Contra hearings, because there's a whole new generation studying the Kennedy assassination now, it became visible for whoever wanted to learn or see that Ollie North said that in case anything ever comes out, I'm to be the fall guy. He agreed to be the fall guy, and like G. Gordon Liddy, they end up millionaires. So the fall guy of the Kennedy assassination was organized crime. Blake, he could make money and write a book on organized crime because then he could screen out the CIA, and organized crime was so broad you could gun down Marcello and Carlos Marcello. Uh, no, he's alive. Uh, Santos Traficana and Sam Giacana and Carlos Prius Sequeiros and get rid of a lot of the mafia figures, and then people say, oh, we'll never know. That's exactly the strategy precisely which, which uh, occurred, the strategy which was used uh, by the uh, select committee. Uh, people uh, like George Moore and Shield, many crucially important, uh, Carlos Frias-Sakaris, very crucial uh, witnesses who would have appeared 
before the committee. And William and, Sullivan and, of the FBI. And William Sullivan, who, who ran Division 5 of Hoover's That's FBI, right. of course. Yeah. Uh, these people were killed just prior to, and in the case of the George Marshall, the day that the he was... very day before. No, the same day he was supposed to meet somebody in the afternoon. Oh, that, the yeah, that was for an interview. Yes. With uh, Edward J. Epstein. No, he met Epstein, a CIA reporter, in the morning and then had lunch with somebody and was supposed to meet a member of the House Select Committee in the afternoon, but his head had been blown off. Oh, that's right. The same and day. The curious part is that no writer ever wrote about the facts of the circumstances surrounding what they called DeMar Shield's suicide. Well, if people got my tapes through the years, and I was chronicling this because I... Well, probably was the only one in the country saying DeMore and Shield uh, was the most important witness of 552 witnesses. And I have a continuous series of material on tape, like you have the tape records, of the demise of DeMore and Shield and the importance of him to Lee and Marina Oswald. And uh, I've written about it, the Nazi connections, the Kennedy assassination. Nobody has ever delved into the Nazi white Russian connections, and DeMore and Shield's head went off and was blown away just at the time that... Somebody might have to ask him one question. Uh, that's right. Uh, DeMar and she was, as we know, uh, Oswald's babysitter. He moved Oswald around in various ways. Uh, and it was Ruth Kane who uh, arranged for Oswald to, she, I have her on videotape saying that she called the depository building. Yeah, she called uh, where, Roy uh, where Oswald was employed. Yeah. And she stated that she... In a letter to her mother, which I located at your house, May, when I visited you yes. uh, 12 years ago. That's right. On a recording, it says that this man who is narrating the recording said, and I've never heard this from anywhere, and I'm grateful to you for it, said that in a letter that Ruth Payne wrote to her mother, she concludes by saying, I'm going to be carrying out my undercover motivations. Yes. Uh, she was a very crucial uh person in the plot primary to frame Oswald from the crime which uh, undoubtedly no one uh, has any evidence at all that he committed uh, that he committed that crime absolutely no evidence uh, remains to this day yeah. well getting back to the House Select Committee because we only have a little bit of time one another thing about G. Robert Blakey that is pertinent to today's news is that uh, Danny Sheehan, the attorney in Washington, filed this uh, suit for the Christic Institute on the secret team, the secret government of guns, assassinations, and uh, narcotics traffic. And the suit begins, his affidavit, with Robert Mayhew, of, who was in the FBI and CIA, hiring uh, uh, Santos Traffic Canada to get a hit team, which included Frank Sturgis, uh, known as Frank Fiorini. But he hired Robert Mayhew, the CIA and the government hired Mayhew to set up a hit team, and Mayhew shared a house apartment with Mo Dallas in Las Vegas. Through this whole period, the, the secret team was working with Mo Dallas, and G. Robert Blakey is the attorney for the man who lived with the CIA FBI official uh, that was hiring the assassins. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I have a... Um a list of uh, the various nefarious uh, activities of uh, Robert Blakey. Uh, you supplied me in a conversation that I had with you several months ago with some information that I did not know about, but uh, about Robert Blakey. But I have a list of the various nefarious practices, uh, m uh, most uh, illuminating, of course, is his uh, complete uh, uh, deception. He committed, Robert Blakey committed perjury before the Congress. Oh, absolutely. Robert Blakey uh, uh, accepted perjurious statements, knowing full well if they were false. I think he should be in jail. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that he is a, a many, uh, a, a, a many-headed uh, uh, sort of scorpion, I guess you could say. Uh, he has been involved in many, uh, just... Uh, Outrageous, atrocious, uh, 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 including civil suits for various people, etc. Uh, I wonder if I might, may, before the show comes to an end, mention the fact, as I well, I did mention the fact that I, I have written a book entitled "The House of My Committee on Assassinations Cover-Up," which is the only book ever written detailing the 
odious uh, cover-up of the troops uh-huh. uh, by the committee. I wonder if I could mention my name and address. Well, I was just going to say, before we get too far, because we just the, we just have a little bit of time here, I want you to give your name and your address, and if people run around your houses and get your pencils, and a lot of people tape this off there, I want you to put the title of the book and what it costs and how they can get it, because in this short time, they can't learn as much as is in the book, but they get a little introduction to hearing you. And uh, give that on the air, and we'll do a, a couple of minutes more on the House Select Committee and the just the evil way that they operated. As I say, the Iran-Contra, the uh, congressional committees, showed you exactly how they covered things up if they brought up something sensitive about Ali North and the federal emergency management. They say, oh, no, 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 off the room, out of the room, out of the room. And, and when these drug witnesses were testifying, Mr. Rodriguez, about George Bush's connections, at the Senate hearings, uh, Senator Kerry said, oh, shh, shush, out of the room, off the record, off the record. That means buried forever and marked national security. They can't see it for 50 years. Okay, give your name and the title of the book and what it costs, and uh, I think people would really be interested in getting it. All right, thank you, May. Uh, uh, the name of the book is The House of the Committee on Assassination Cover-Up. Uh, it is 300 page long, pages long. The total cost is $19. Uh, my name is Ted Gandolfo, G-A-N-D-O-L-F, as in Frank O. That's Ted Gandolfo. My address is 169 Grange, like Red Grange, G-R-A-N-G-E Street, Franklin Square, that's Franklin Square, New York, 11010. And as I said, the cost of the book is $19. Yeah. May, uh, since I sense that we're coming to the conclusion of this, may I again thank you, and may I uh, really? say Before that we... uh, yeah. it's always a pleasure. I, the last time you and I did a show was uh, uh, on... Um, WBAI here in New York. Yeah. And it's nice teaming up with you again, and thank you for this opportunity. Now, don't hang up yet, because uh, there was something else I wanted you to bring up. Uh, in addition to writing this book, you might quickly tell the listeners how many tapes you have and the content of some of your videotapes that they would want, and tapes that you, the recorded history of what was on the air and at the hearings. Uh, how many of you accumulated? Do you have it in the library now? Where is it, Wisconsin? It's in uh, Wisconsin University. Wisconsin University. How many tapes do you have there for students to see? Uh, well, I put um, in 1983, uh, I gave them, I supplied to them, and it now resides in my own archive under my name, uh, 4,300 hours of tape recordings, uh, including videotapes, audio tapes, etc., plus 29 boxes of printed documents. Mm -hmm. At the present time, I have accumulated more than 700 hours from that day in 1983. Mm -hmm. uh, so my tapes are continuing. I had my own Manhattan cable TV shows, hourly, weekly shows. Uh, seven of them were recorded on videotape. And uh, for anybody who writes me uh, for the book, I will send them a, uh, who orders the book, I will send them a list, a of, list the of, the, of the video and audio tapes that I am selling at a very low cost, mm -hmm. and they were called the best TV shows ever on the on the case. That's great. That's really good. Yeah, you've accumulated a lot of material and sent for material, and I think you are the most courageous person in the United States challenging this House Select Committee that very quietly buried itself without a whimper, and you've been in the forefront and gutsy in taking on the Justice Department and Robert Blakey with friends like Mo Dallas and that crew down at La Costa. It takes a lot of guts to go to Washington and to write and call them, and you do it continuously. Well, I have appeared in Washington and confronted Blakey and his attorney, Louis Neiser, and I met a man named Jeff Fogel there in the Justice Department, and they are presently seeking to find the Clifford Fenton report, and they are going to be issuing a report, the Justice Department report, on the House Committee's uh, uh, investigation. And I'm still waiting for that material and the answers to whether or not 
they can locate the Clifford Fenton report. And as soon as I have that available, of course, I will share that with you, and you can uh, let the people know what they concluded. Okay, great. Well, listen, thank you very, very much. And people can get your videos. They're impressive. Get your tapes. They're all on their own. They've got to study this because it's very important. Dave, thank you very much. God love you. And okay. nice talking to all of your people. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good night, Dave. Good night. Okay, that's Ted Gandolfo from New York City. And we were going to have five hours of visitors. <laughs> These listeners didn't get it, but they still appreciate what we're doing, right? Now I want to take up here, ladies. Okay. I'm not used to the extra mics in here. Okay. It's great to get that much right, information. We have um, the the wonders of technology, electronic technology. We have 46 pledges made for $899. Oh, no, no, no. $1,899. $1,899. $1,899. Yeah, $1,899. I'm, uh, I'm an old, You're old bookkeeper. <laughs> I'm too old. One, she just ignores it. $1,800. Yes. 46 people have pledged. 46 people. Yeah, it, that's just amazing. We want to give out the phone number once again. Three, yeah, you give it out here. 375-7275. There are people standing by waiting to talk to you and commiserate with you. And 375-3082. It's only going to be here for another 40 minutes. I don't, do you think I should take calls or not, or should we just stop sure. here? Do you think it, so? It's up well, to you if you okay. feel like you uh, want to take, um, yeah, I'm sure there's people who want to take answer calls, questions. But, but I don't want you to ask uh, <laughs> a redundant question. What can we do? You can write to All me. Right, I'll stuff the envelope with self-addressed stamped envelope. I'll tell you what I think you should do. Uh, somebody said, can you recommend books that you should read, continue our education, I have a list that Tom Davis carries of very important books, and uh, he has them under subjects, and like the Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King, fascism, and I told him to make one list of the 20 most important books, because I'm always asked that way, and when I would lecture around. Uh, in 1967, when I was doing campus lectures in different places around the country, and people would say, what uh, is the most important book to read on John Kennedy? Because that's what I was talking about then, before and right after Watergate. The very first book that you can't even get anymore was Project Paperclip, how 900 Nazi mm -hmm. scientists were brought in the United States and literally took over the country. You can't know who blew Kennedy's head off if you don't read Project Paperclip. And there's a new book out on Paperclip. Maybe Tom will call in from uh, uh, Aptos. I was going to have on tonight. Tom, if you're listening, call up and and uh, give your address on the air, and then I won't have to answer their mail. God, you're standing here. JT's got a hand so full we need a basket. <laughs> this is bigger than my Christmas list. I don't know. <laughs> uh, how about that? Did any other programmer get that many in an hour? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I have to keep asking that because I, I just want to thank you people and commend you for this wonderful spirit. Now, here's a question. There is a caller on the line right now holding for you. I didn't see the light going, but I'll answer it. <laughs> okay, my lines are switched a little. Uh We've got it ready to go. Zing, zing. We'll try one more time. Yeah. It's like my alarm. Oh, there hello. Yeah, you're on the air. Oh, hi, May. Well, <laughs> this is quite a program, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I had something that I saw in the paper today. Um, I, don't, I was down getting some coffee, and I read the paper at the coffee shop. And on the back page where the weather report is, <clears throat> squeezed in a little teeny one-sentence uh, article about an inch long in today's Monterey Herald on the weather page yeah. says that um, Dennis Banks has plea bargained in that case oh my. and has is pleading guilty in exchange for his co-defendants, the charges being dropped. So now that's the sad st end of that story. Now we have our two leading American Indian uh, uh, fighters here are in well, the federal pen. So the others will go off, and Peltier and, and now Banks they have will Peltier stay in jail. And Banks in, on the inside. Oh in my God! Facilities. Yeah, I was going to do. It's sad. Oh, I really was, sad. And I yeah, I didn't have to. I, notice where the Herald put it. Yeah, well, I and how long it was. <laughs> well, you know, with the, like the Bob Dylan song, you would know what the weather is. You have to read the weather report to know where the yeah, uh, right on the weather what's going page. on. Right? Look in your today's Herald, folks. I miss that. I miss that. Here's another. And question. I had a couple of things I wanted to. Share um, in uh, a week ago Sunday in, in the book section there was a, a book review of the the Chomsky Reader. Oh yes. And there was a couple of one sentence statements that they took out of that book that I want to share with the listeners. Okay, real fast because this very, evening it is very that kind pertinent. of a program. Okay. Uh, on on the rare occasions in which I have the opportunity to discuss these issues with people in the media or academic professions, I often find not so much disagreement as an inability to hear. 
Yeah. Remember to hear that. Chomsky. To hear the truth. Yeah, well, Chomsky doesn't tell the whole truth. It's like we were talking about. The I other... know, but that's something that we need to keep in mind. If, about if you the hear Chomsky. Truth in general. Yeah, yeah, but you have to separate and, that source. Okay, I mean, now, cliches one, are cheap. The second, the second one, also important. Propaganda is to democracy what violence is to a totalitarian state. What does that mean? Indoctrination is a valuable mechanism for control since yeah. it effectively blocks understanding. And understanding, like compassion and intelligence, can only be developed by use. I think that's an indication of what's going on today yeah. as the propaganda machine is starting to break down and some truth is starting to glimmer into the minds of the American public. We're starting to see all of this violence, so it tells you how close we're getting oh, yeah, the to the totalitarian state. Yeah, so, when the native population wakes up. Yeah, so that's why we're seeing the violence suddenly Absol increase. They have to blow them away. That's right. right. Listen, thanks a lot for calling. Okay, well, thanks I'm looking forward to uh, our get-together whenever it'll be. Yeah, I have to ask my, <laughs> my security advisor when I can open right. these doors to the public. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I mentioned this, I think, last week on the air that... Uh, at the film festival, some friends drove up the parking lot at Sunset Center, and uh, and uh, their car pulled up, my car pulled up, and then a third car was there, and a man came out and said, oh, May Russell, I recognize you. I don't think he said, listen to me. He said, I'm a friend of your bodyguard. <laughs> I said, oh, my bodyguard. He said, yeah, Richard, and I, he, he's in the SEALs, in the, in the Marines. Huh. And I figure, well, maybe Richard says, I have to leave now from the, wherever they're having beer at the tavern, and protect me, and maybe just following me, because I don't even know who Richard is, and I thought of Ollie North as in charge of the SEALs, and one of the calls in L.A. said, I'm a soldier from Ollie North, and maybe you're jumping to conclusions, but Richard, if you're my bodyguard, I don't know you, come forward. But I was thinking about that, that was really, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so protection, I have to be careful about the potlucks, because of, I don't know who It's my a tricky time are. right now. It's yeah. tricky, yeah, we'll offer the book, for the pledges, and I'll have to, you know, see what's happening. Should I take one more call? Yeah, let's Hello. do it. Hello. 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 Yes. You're on the air. You want to be on the air or you want to pledge? Maybe we shouldn't confuse Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Well, me, Bristol. It's been a long time since I've talked to you. Oh, do I know you? Uh, very, very slightly. I visited you once when you were in the barnyard. Okay. And I was very impressed. You seem to have a, well, not you seem, you obviously do have an awful lot of sources of open intelligence. And the first thing I wanted to say as a libertarian butcher was thanks a lot, sincerely, for saying that fascism is leftist. We, I said it's both. Well, if I, I didn't say it was the left, and uh, well, I the said it comes from lots of sources. Well, the criterion I'm using uh, is the strength of government. We see less government is being on the right and more government is being toward the left and since Hitler wanted to kill people that's obviously an awful lot of governmental power and we think Hitler was a lefty well uh, let, we'll have to end that conversation now I like dialogues but I don't like stupidity and uh, if Hitler is a leftist so help me uh, <laughs> I don't know what's what government there is if Hitler's a leftist maybe we shouldn't take these calls tonight maybe we should just have our own dialogue I don't want to think at the end of of 17 years on the air, I have to hear that Hitler's a leftist. <laughs> you know, God knows. You can call it and make your pledges, but that's really uh, silly. Uh, the, there was, speaking of the outlets of news media breaking up, there's a big story uh, from Wall Street Journal this past week and all the news media. Uh, UPI, United Press International, and our sources are Reuters, Associated Press, United Press, has been taken over by a Dr. Earl Bryan, who was head of health welfare for Reagan, who was the man who put up the money for Mrs. Meese and her house, a very political person. And now with unknown millions, he was always in trouble with the government. He's come in and taken up one third of our media access. And Dr. Earl Bryan, the close friend of Edwin Meese, who was funding his house and home. What does and, that mean, media access? Well, our access is UPI, Associated Press, and Reuters. And the rest you I have see. to scrounge I for. See. And uh, at the time when Meese was under investigation and the grenade invasion, it was uh, Murdoch who went into Chicago and Mike Royka left the Chicago Tribune because he came in like $43 million bought the paper and said, no more talk about Mies or Grenada. 
That's me, the mm-hmm. axis. I bought the whole paper. And Mike Royke was telling it. And Wall Street Journal tells about this Dr. Earl Bryan with his, he's into, and I did lots of broadcasts when Mies was being nominated for Attorney General, into biotechnology, genetic alterations, money scandals, shams. And the money is coming. The largest stockholder is Merrill Lynch which is Don Reagan. I've been doing broadcasts on mm-hmm. Maryland. Mm-hmm. So UPI was held by a Mexican company. And uh, another uh, item about Earl Bryan, he's chairman of a communication systems, FNN, but he never had 30 or $41 million to buy UPI. There are pockets of what I call Nazi money that are used for people to buy an airline, a movie studio. They go to Europe, pick up $40 million, by this now UPI is bought uh, another Merrill Lynch is involved a another story head of UPI had a long acquaintance with Mies and it tells about his company Hadron that I had on the air and his biotechnology things he's a doctor and comes in with these hunks of money and the UPI team are there was an article saying that they're going to take care of uh, publications at the time of elections and mm-hmm. so who knows what we're going to see this article cited that UPI will be handling elections and Olympics in South Korea and a close associate financially psychologically of Mies and Reagan is going to take one third of the major news access with a hunk of 41 million he was always under the verge of criminal investigation and now he's bought this source we had a question. Listener wanted to know if you will still be on KGO next week, and if so, when? Nope, nope, not none of that. None of this that. is it, right? This is it. None of that. And you business. won't be doing uh, public speaking engagements? No, I've cut a lot of that out anyway. Uh, people can get the tapes. Everything I have to say is on tapes. They can get those, and it's all there. They don't, You know, there's people that like to follow you like groupies, and you drive all the way to San Francisco to do a program. As a matter of fact, um, it, it was in the offing to go there, but I doubt if it went through. Barbara Honig was up there a couple of weeks ago, and she was with Michael Krasner. Now, can I use the profanity allow on KGO? Can I use it on sure, go ahead. I Kazoo listen. tonight? Okay, Barbara Honiger, who's done all this extensive work on George Bush and the White House and the stealing of elections, was a guest of Michael Krasner's, and uh, they have this six-second six hold to break everything out, okay? So somebody called in at the second hour of the program and said, do you know Mae Brussel? And they started to say Radio Free America, that word that would identify David Emery's program. And the beeper went on. It goes ding, 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 right on the air. And Krasner apologizes that he can't use Mae Brussel's name. And oh. later in the program, six different people called. And there's a man up there. His, his name is Jim, who has an eight-hour shift to make sure. There's a man up there, his his name is Jim, who has an eight-hour shift to make sure that her name isn't on KGO. And I knew things were coming down because this has just been the last two months, okay? And so then, a few minutes later, here's a lady on the show, and a man calls up and says, will you suck my dick? And they allow it on the show with Barbara Honecker as a diss. So I'm the profanity. The word isn't a profanity anymore. Mm -hmm. Mae Brussel is a profanity. So I called Ray Talfiero, and a lot of people know I'm on there quite a bit. He came down and called, wanted to spend a weekend at the house. He was at the house. We're good friends, and he's at the top of the news all the time. About a month and a half ago, I called when the swastikas were in the police department because who knows as much about the San Francisco Fire Department and Police Department. And this Jim answered the phone, can't be on. Okay, so I wrote to Ray, and I said, I want you to know that your producer says I can't call in now, and I know working towards election, you can't tell these people. So I wrote him a letter at his home because we talk on the phone and correspond. He didn't answer the letter. He wouldn't say, I'll leave the station if they censor it. He just says, I choose to be on, and I know you can't be on. And that's what happened in Germany. Every So here's a guy that walks in and shoots up places, you know, churches, and says he belongs to the Nazi party. One says, I'm a fascist. And... Eventually, the Jews and blacks will get it, but they all, Michael Krasny, Jewish, and Rachel Alvira, black, they all play the game until it comes down, and they don't have the courage to speak up or walk away. They're, they've got their investment in wherever they live, in the car, in the prestige, and they are going to go the full route until, you know, enjoy oh, yeah. the goodies. And so um, it, that's how far it's gone. 
in general media coverage. It's amazing, isn't it? It's frightening. It's yeah, frightening. the avenues are being cut off. Yeah. Did you have a question? The news will get... Um, Morning, no, no. I think... Um, did someone hand you one there? Yeah, I got a notice here. Uh, did I say the tie or towel call nope. in? Okay, thank you from Santa Cruz. And you're all going to get the American Swastika. There's a group, in fact, one boy, uh, and Nestle's, uh, worked at Nestle's for seven years, who are boycotting GE, the second largest nuclear weapon maker. Their address is closed. In fact, brings GE to light. This is a message by Dave Ratcliffe about GE and uh, weapons. And so, Nestle, these people will have to not use May Brussels for the sources of communication. You're all on your own now, and you've got to write more letters to the editor, and you've got to put your energy into a broader, a broad range. Whatever you're doing, it's got to even be broader, and it has to be more people that understand that these messages can't be conveyed. As a matter of fact, Benny called me this week. He said, be sure to announce that there's a fair up at Christic Institute in Santa Cruz this next week. Uh, you could do those things. Now the people are getting called like the two in L.A. Stop working for the Christic or I'm a fascist and you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do you run a uh, a lawsuit that requires 40,000 a week? And what they're doing now in L.A. is trying they put, as I say, an article in L.A. Weekly to see how many other people like you wouldn't know about the KGO or the mail, how many other people are getting it and will the publisher tell people that these avenues are closed? Yeah. And talk about UPI and all these. A lot of people don't know who Dr. Earl Bryan is, but if they look up the Meese hearings, he's the one that was partnered with Mrs. Meese and putting up the house and all that stuff. Now he owns UPI. Mm -hmm. Going into a dark period. Oh. Oh, yeah. You and know? with unlimited, the Philippine gold that Singh Lao says he has his hands on and being a president of the World Anti-Communist League and Singh Lao was, he's on the board of Western Golds and had computers from the police department right into Western Golds and then it moved, you know, their offices in Washington with uh, Carl Spitz Channel and taking uh, money from the secret team and putting into defeating congressmen like Congressman Barnes from Maryland. It, it's a whole process that has been growing and growing and uh, long listeners know that uh, my favorite movie of all time is The Serpent's Egg and it was put out by Ingmar Bergman and the minute it came out it was bought up and closed up and it, it all of a sudden surfaced at this film festival uh, group film that I belong to. Anyone can join it. They have films that come out from Pennsylvania and videos that you can you subscribe and I get one foreign film a week and so people were able to come to the house and see Serpent's Egg again. And it's the serpent has a sack that's visible and is a snake or the cobra, whatever is growing. You see it growing and growing. And the story is Germany in the 1919s and mm. 1920. And until it gives birth, this fatal uh, snake, everyone watches it grow, but nobody uh, breaks the sack. It's a really interesting movie. Yeah. Yeah, maybe sometime if some of you subscribers, uh, I put it generally, I have your name and address, and maybe that I'll order the serpent's egg instead of a, a potluck dinner, have some showings for six or eight people, let them come That'd see be great. it. Yeah. And uh, I'll get back to all of you in one way or another, and maybe if you want to come down and, and see that, and then another group, instead of having a large group, it's harder to control <laughs> and have them come down and see that. Yeah, I just started subscribing to the... Uh, Arkansas newspaper because the trial of the Aryan nations and and Richard Butler there now and so I have a pile of articles that if these threats weren't coming I would continue on World Watchers putting it but the front page of the paper February 27th last Saturday said the uh, Saturday for the Psalms justifies the actions for the the CSA movement this is the very very violent right-wing group that uh, are under trial for sedition and trying to overthrow the country and they quote the King James Bible that said, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud with their, upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their uh, bodies and with the fetters of iron, their nobles with the fetters of iron. And to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have the saints, praise the Lord. 
And their motto is, uh, we, the Bible has told us that we can get rid of heads of states and the kings and the nobles and kill them, keep a two-edged sword and kill them. And their justification for throwing over the country is to uh, do this. And they also have had stories, Chicago Tribune and local papers, Fort Smith, Arkansas, the trial uh, wanted 14 Nazis on sedition. Among other things, they planned to poison municipal water supply, neo-Nazi leaders working to blow up natural gas pipelines from Texas to Chicago. The conspiracy they're on trial for is to poison an urban water supply that began when Michigan's neo-Nazi preachers supplied 200 pounds of cyanide to the Klan from Oregon and Arkansas, all combined and around the country. And they planned to backplant the poison into a commando raid either in the Chicago Water Infiltration Plant or Lake Michigan and fill up the reservoirs in New York and Washington and immediately would kill 400,000. I was on KLRB only three weeks when somebody gave me information of the plans of these Nazis to put cyanide in Lake Michigan in 1971. And I called the FBI that many years ago. And these people have been out doing this thing. Hmm. 400,000 just right you know, uh, off the bat to kill. And there, there will be such chaos because they have built their own compounds with telephone, electricity, food, orchards, supply lines that they have dug across the country so they can outlive the immediate thing of these other areas being cut off, electricity and power. This is just this week's paper. I'm not reading a, a science fiction. <laughs> I think they got enough tonight, these poor people, mm -hmm. don't you think? Yes, indeed. On what's coming down? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is 375 3072375 and I want to thank you, you people that have been calling in and uh, pledging to the station. This was very difficult because I didn't know, uh, not having World Watchers on the air next week or on this uh, or other stations, that includes KFJC, KKUP, and so forth, uh, I didn't know the mindset of people that would think, well, as long as there's not something political. Well, we were talking a little bit at the break about possibilities for the show, and there are some other things, some, some tapes you were talking about. David, David Emery, and, yeah. And possibilities of still somehow getting the information out there. Yeah, I can supply it now. David Emery feels safe. Uh, he doesn't have a phone. He's not listed. So he may someday walk out of KFJC and get what they told me I was going to get. He feels comfortable down in there, but what he's done with his broadcast is to put the background using these books that are available that people can get and put the background for these various events that are happening, you know, the historical perspective. And because the real thing uh, that he has weekly, the hot stories like the ones I put on and we share a lot of material, uh, that's the real threat. But that's not down in a city with the population of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So the other is academic, and they're not blowing up libraries. So, so far, he's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's I just called him immediately and said, you know. Being a channel for information. Oh, oh, another call. Oh, Tom Davis is on the line. Well, we'll certainly talk to Tom because uh, education is really, really the uh, key to this. And you can do the same, not the same amount of reading I did, but you can do a lot more. And also, Tom is the one who's providing you with uh, American Swastika. Are we up there? Hello. Hello, May. Oh, hi. How are you? Guess where I've been. Where? At the library. No. <laughs> Down at my warehouse wrapping packages of books. <laughs> packages of books. Okay, well, maybe. Do you come down Saturday? Uh, you usually come down here on Saturday. I could get them from you, and then we, they could mail them out from here. Oh, well, yeah. There's no problem. Bring a box of books. Uh, thank you. How many times, how many listeners? Uh, oh, we've 48. got 46, 40, 48. 46, 48. What do you think of the response tonight? I, I'm overwhelmed, May. Isn't I, it amazing? Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I got 100 copies of American <laughs> Swastika. It looks like they'll all be gone. Yeah, can you believe, isn't the response amazing? It really is. It really is. It really is. I mean, what can I say? I just, I felt so badly, you know, for the station going off at the time of fundraising. Here's a pledge that came in. From Stanley, $100. I'm just looking at these things. I, I really, in a world where there are few surprises anymore, I'm really surprised and so happy. Well, it's terrific, and it shows that people are out there, and we're, and we're going to need them. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we're, we're getting a little bit on here, and uh, we need this young blood. Yeah, and, and, of course, you and I have talked. In fact, I was going to have you 
as a guest for a longer segment, we talk about how people should get these books now because they're not around later. That's right, and I there's just a couple things I wanted to say about books. You know, the effective life on the shelf in the average bookstore for a hardcover book is just one year. Mm -hmm. And, for example, you know, the uh, book about Michele Sindona, Power on Earth, uh -huh. was out for one year last uh, September, and now it's out of print and gone. Well, now you tell me something you didn't save one for me. <laughs> You've got one. <laughs> Not power on earth. Oh, sure you do. No, I'll have to get out the guillotine and you can. Well, no, well, maybe one of those little visitors you've been having in your house picked well, it up. Well, but... you know, I you come down, you say to me, you have a book, and the book isn't there when I go for it. That happens a lot. Yeah, I know that. Over the years, it sure has. Yeah. But that's just a lesson to people that, uh, you know, I put on my catalog, of which there's 638 titles. Mm -hmm. It's enough to drive you nuts. But there's 638 titles on there, and uh, I always put the date, the year the book was published, and people got to follow that because yeah. a year after that date, they want to expect that book to start disappearing. But the important thing is when they catch on, they can also go to used bookstores, and you go up and down the coast getting those books to yeah, provide but, you know, for people. Power on Earth, for example, they're not going to find it. It was put out by Arbor House, which was... Uh, <laughs> Oddly owned by the Hearst Corporation. Yeah. And it's it's gone. Well, that's like Alternative 3, the, the plans for genocide, which are coming about now with the space stations to get rid of 70% of the Earth's population. And it was came out as a uh, nonfiction scientific study. And uh, then they took it off. It was impossible to get. Right. Well, we did an end run about them. You know, yeah. I imported 100 copies from England. Yeah, I know. So we uh, we were... We did the number on them there, but they deserved it, you know, yeah. because it's a terrific book. And some of the out-of-prints, you've been copying and I've been copying. I think we should go into a business getting out the out-of-print books. I know. We just, when I was talking to you Saturday, we went over at least 10 yeah. important books that ought to be reprinted, but we can't always get the rights, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I, I wanted to tell your uh, audience about five books that they can still get and they really should consider it and uh, i'll just run them down of course the first one uh, is the great heroine coup yeah uh, which you know tells about the jockeying between different power groups for the drug trade all over the world it's extremely important very important book and uh, that was 1980 and that's still in print from south end press yeah. it's a little liberal press in in boston and that's why it's still in print it's eight dollars and, uh -huh. and they should really think about that that's then, right then next is in banks we trust yeah that was your premium you donated the station last time right it was and a that's major still available because it's yeah. printed by uh, it was reprinted in paperback by uh, penguin books which is a british company and i'm sure that's why it's available yeah and it's subtitled Bank Bankers and Their Close Associates, the CIA, okay. the Mafia. Give me about traders. give me the others real fast because we're going to run out of time here. Dictators, we have a yeah. In banks we trust. Politicians and, and the Vatican. And okay. then uh, getting up closer to this date is Inside the League. I think. Oh, absolutely. If there was any one book that, yeah. of the current crop, yeah, that I would buy would be Inside yeah. the, the League. The World Anti-Communist League. Like, absolutely. It's the shocking expose of how terrorists, Nazis, and Latin American death squads have well, infiltrated the would, world anti-communist league. And, and John Singlam is the chairman. How would you like to have the two trillion that uh, the Philippines gold in the hands of the world anti-communist league? Well, this not only tells the Nazi connections, you know, yeah. and including all those characters running around there in the Philippines. Very important. But the old China lobby and the dope dealing with the clear back to Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah, yeah. L okay, Very listen, important. I, and then, uh, then yeah. a little bit closer up last uh, fall, the Iran-Contra connection, yeah. secret teams and covert operations in the Reagan Well, that's era. current. Yeah, that's right. Jonathan Marshall, Peter Dale Scott. How about Spooks? Is that still available? Spooks is out of print. Oh, what a and shame. Impossible. Yeah. And, uh, but that, that's 1977. I'll say a minute, a word about that in a minute. Then the final one that is available, Out of Control uh -huh. by Leslie Coburn, because yeah. that tells about not only the Contra Gate, but it includes Barbara Honiger's story. I know. About uh, yeah. Bush stealing uh, the election for Reagan in That's 1980. Right. That's right. A very important story. So, yeah, but I, I think 
all of these are important. They are available and uh, they are available. They yeah. they can be bought now, you know, without yeah. trouble. But but yeah. this is not going to be true all the time. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate your getting on the line here, and I want to thank you. Do you girls want to thank him for the premium? Yeah, that's been tremendous, and thank you so much, Tom, for your support throughout the years, and especially for this marathon. Yeah, and well, our other ones. <laughs> JD, how about you, Orange? Should we thank Tom for all of this? She's going to my microphone mind. cord isn't long enough. I have to either listen or talk. I can we hear thank you. you, Tom. We thank you for all your support. We thank you, Aries Arts, for underwriting World Watchers, for your support for the station, uh, for calling in tonight. Thank you for responding and being part of the program tonight. Well, people can uh, can. Uh, we may have some more people me. to thank. Uh, we've had even more calls. Yeah, yeah. I was oh. just going to say you can write me an Aptus, Tom oh. Davis Books, Aptus, California nine five zero zero one. Well, you have a PO box. Well, yeah. Just think about rolling the dice. It's eleven oh seven. Eleven oh seven. The winning dice, you know. Okay, eleven oh seven. That's it. Okay, Tom Davis, who has given you the American Swastika and provided books for you. Thank you very, very much. Okay, okay. May. Bye-bye. If I could just say one thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I recall back in World War II where the Nazis tried to, to round up all the Jews in Denmark. You know, all the Jews had to wear this yellow star. Uh-huh. So what happened? All the people in Denmark put on yellow stars. Well, that's what we have to do here. And exactly. that's what we have to do here. Absolutely. Everybody. Okay. Everybody. Everybody get out and do their part. Everybody say, I'm a world watcher. Okay. Thanks a million. Thanks, bye Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. That's great that he called in. I really appreciate it. And a check from Jerry for $100. And right, Debbie, you. can you believe this? That's great. Here, you can have, you can add these up. I mean, this is the world record. I want, I just challenge you other programmers to just get on and pull this <laughs> oh, one. Oh, sure. Thanks. Come oh, on. I'm going to be listening. I'll listen over the weekend. And they want, some of you wanted my address. It's May Brussels, P.O. Box 22511, uh, Carmel 93922. And I may go under, but I'm not out. And I will be in touch with all of you wonderful people because you're very special. Over $2,000. Yeah. 50 people this evening. That's 2,169. Great. Maybe. Page gets close to that, right? He's been... Nope, I'm sorry. Even Rama doesn't do that. Rama B. Jama didn't do that? Nope. He but he's on tomorrow morning. He's, he has, uh, he's trying. He has a goal to establish. It, it's a race now. But, you know, one of the things that is so important for people to know, I brought up it the last time we had the marathon, the response of people. You know, some people think, oh, political activism is depressing. It's it's not good. And let's get off. I, I refer to that light music, the easy music, the easy out. And these people are not only responsive and they talk intelligently, they feel, they care, they show it, but they can do all the other things too, but they come through when it's important. And we that, have uh, David Smith calling from Long Beach on the line. Oh, David Smith from Long Beach. Well, can we do a quickie? How do you get the number? Let's see what this is. It's your show taped, he says. Oh. And I wanted to call you on your last show. A friend told me, told him that it was your okay. Maybe it was on KPFK. Let's just see for one second. Hi, Maybe. David, are you there? Hello. Wait. Hello? Hello. Yeah, we have about one minute here. From Long Beach, how are you? Oh, fine. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy, a few weeks before he died, gave a speech, and he said that uh, the office of the presidency had been used to perpetuate a conspiracy against the American people, mm-hmm. and that it, his, it was his duty to rectify this before he well, left. Well, I remember you, David, of course. I yeah. Mean, he's being Salinas. Yeah, I was a slave once. He, works, he was a slave. <laughs> he, works, he makes these models for movies of the horror movies and dinosaurs and reconstructs. He's a really good artist. Yeah, I didn't ring a bell. Yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think this conspiracy was he was talking about? Well, he said that he didn't trust the CIA. He wanted that there was a literal gun behind his back, and it was running the White House, and he wanted to shatter to the winds. So he fired Alan Dulles. He didn't just say it. He fired the chief of the CIA who had been bringing in all these Nazis, and as soon as he was murdered, Alan Dulles was appointed to the Warren Commission. Right. And it had been fired by Kennedy. That's the conspiracy he was talking about. Do you, do you think it had anything to do with the Federal Reserve notes? And, and well, uh, I heard that he tried to print a real federal note. Well, that's, uh, you know, some people called up about the Federal Reserve. We have about two minutes to go let it tonight, three minutes. And that is something different. He knew that decisions he wanted to pull out of Vietnam. He didn't intend to invade Cuba, and that was the kiss of death because the... Cubans wanted that. So he was making a lot of waves, wanting to be his own boss. So whether it was banking or Vietnam or the nuclear test ban treaty, without him, we'd still be drinking plutonium-90 in the milk. 
Yeah. So there were so many. His brother was trying to break up an organized crime. So I got to run now, but I'm really glad you called up. Did you know this is the last broadcast as is? Yes, my girlfriend's taping the show in place, and she called me and told me that. I'm so, very sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, but I'll be in touch with you. Call when you get up here, and you can still get information. She can reach me. Okay, thank you, May. Thank you. Good okay. Night. Yeah, that's one of my slaves. Isn't that nice? Yeah, they used to, they used to pay hundred dollars, come work for the day, and be my slave. He paid it money to be a slave. They gave us a hundred dollars. I know to do. it's excellent, and they could be my slave, and it was really great. People being a slave is different than a helper. A helper comes in, you have lunch, you make coffee, you talk, <laughs> you know, and you have to be sociable because they're helping you. A slave simply comes in, it's peanut butter and celery or bread. And instant coffee and no conversation. You don't bake anything for him. You don't have to be hospitable. When people help, you have to be nice. Yes. But the slave, you just crack the whip. I want to remind everybody that uh, we will have the information, May's uh, P.O. Box number and all that. So if you're not catching it tonight, you can call the station throughout the next couple of weeks, and we will gladly give that to you over the phone. And I'm listed in the book. And, and you, you can keep sending it, and it's time just about to go. But uh, how can I thank these people? Well, I don't know. I, I think all the work you've been doing over the years is a big thank you to everyone. Yeah, but I mean, I really was worried that the timing coming with the program, but look I how know. they came through. I mean, it really is great that you're going to continue to send in money to Kazoo. You'll get a book. You'll keep up with Tom's books and with other researchers and myself and you know, I'm too much of a big mouth to shut up. I'll just, uh, I took orders from this guy for now, but uh, I said, okay, you win, but I'll be around, and you hopefully smart you, people will know how to find me. Hopefully you'll be back. Yeah. And, and May is really going to try to help us, and with your audience help, too, to fill these two hours every Monday night with something yeah. that's I'll give you David's tapes, and you can give a try. Okay, well, that's it for this evening. We're going to stop now, and I'll be back. No, I won't be back with you next week. I'm wait, wait one second. I just say goodbye. Bye, man. <laughs> goodbye. Look at this uh, gang. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We hope you're back for soon. Now. <laughs> you better come back, May. Okay, come for some of the potlucks. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we'll be together. Plus, 50 plus pledges. 50 plus. Okay. They're still taking pledges. Oh, keep going, and I'll be here taking the call. I said I'd work tonight, so if you guys want to call in, I'll be here for a while. Before I finish, the previous hour, World Watchers has been made possible. We have to do the business in part by ARC, Laser Optical Technology, a leading manufacturer of microcomputer peripherals, located in Scotts Valley, available by calling 438-7400. Thank you very much for doing the patron grant so long for this program, and we maybe get David Emery's program, and you'll have some hot material. You won't even miss me. We want to thank Vi. She just called in. She's, I guess, our last pledger for World Watchers. They'll probably keep Yeah, I'll be here for three hours working. I volunteered to do that before I knew this was happening. So hang in there and enjoy uh, what you've heard. Get some tapes and listen. They'll fill the slot, and hopefully David Emery, and you can hear this material. Yeah, please keep in touch, listeners. Okay, or whatever you want to do, I'll leave that up. Yes, and you can always get in touch with May here. (laughs) Okay, thanks.